this video will hi everybody i am paula ludwig with the atlantic institute this is our cultural uh cuisine of different cultures class and um i'm going to turn it over to our instructor in a few minutes um the atlantic institute is about uh learning about other cultures, religions, meeting your next door neighbor, having positive conversations about stuff. Um, and we, our vision is of a peaceful world and we feel like doing um, stuff like this is one way to get there. Um, I am gonna show you a short two minute video about the Atlantic Institute and then I will turn this over to our instructor. The Atlantic Institute is a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting harmonious coexistence between peoples of various cultures, faiths, and backgrounds. We seek this goal through peaceful dialogue, education initiatives, and community organization. Our dialogue events bring together experts, community and faith leaders, and knowledge seekers to address social issues that affect us all. We feel dialogue is the most important element in peaceful coexistence, so we try and maintain several panel discussions, TED Talk events, and book clubs throughout the year. These events touch on social issues, race relations, and cultural understanding and are a mainstay of our programming. The Atlantic Institute's education events are extremely important to our mission of understanding. We want to promote socially forward critical thinking to students of all ages. To that end, we have developed programs that seek to grow the creative spirit of students and help them think about their communities and the world around them. Our Future Leaders of Dialogue event brings together nominated elite students to learn from each other as well as political and business leaders. Our Art and Essay contest gives students a theme about important societal issues and allows them to create wonderful works of art and writing while steering their minds towards improving their world. We are always seeking ways to educate youths and adults in order to make a peaceful world for all of us. Our community events are designed to transform neighbors into friends and groups of people into a community. By associating with other nonprofits or by our own initiative, we are always trying to discover new avenues to improve our neighborhoods, places of worship, and community centers. We host cooking demonstrations of food from other cultures, work with various nonprofits to help elevate the work of others, and try to find a way to make the lives of those who are disenfranchised or marginalized better. Building a more peaceful world starts in our backyards, so we are dedicated to improving our communities and associations. The Atlantic Institute is always seeking like-minded volunteers and collaborators. If you would like to learn more, find volunteer opportunities, or just want to chat with our staff, please visit our website at www.AtlanticInstituteSC.org or follow us on Facebook. We will never run out of fun, educational, peaceful events, so come join us to help make this world a better place full of understanding and unity. All right, and with that being said, um, we are not only just looking for volunteers and interns right now, we are hiring um, planners across the United States. Um, we are looking for four people, um, one in the Pacific time zone, one in the mountain time zone, one in the central north time zone, and one in the eastern northern time zone. Um, so if you're interested, contact me or... Um, Yes, contact me or you can send me your email address here in the chat. Um, for those of you who are just coming in, if you could put where you're from, that would be awesome. It helps us uh, see how far we're reaching with our programming. And I am now going to turn this over to Lorana. She is one of our advisory board members and a huge supporter of the Atlantic Institute in many ways. And she does classes for us every once in a while. And I believe today we're making uh, plantain fritters and cocoa. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to her now. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to be here with you today. Um, I love cooking. I love food. I love eating. So this is definitely um, 
exciting time for me. Uh, I am a recently retired farmer. Um, I retired a year ago as a farmer running a farm to table restaurant and catering company in South Carolina. Um, over this past year, as I stopped to really revision the next chapter, um, my retirement has taken me to Ecuador. Um, I now live full time in Ecuador, um, a town, beautiful town called Cuenca in Ecuador, up in the mountains, uh, just under about 8,000 feet of elevation. And um, it's given me a new opportunity to explore new foods and new ways of using some of the foods that I already know. Um, I uh, am a grandmother, so I uh, came back. I'm here in the States now, uh, hailing right now from Duluth, Georgia, where I am here at my daughter's and my grandson's house. So he will be helping me today. Um, this is Mars. Mars is gladly eating snacks. And so he and I will be your official taste testers today. And let me tell you a little bit quickly about what we'll be preparing and then we'll get started as I go ahead and start turning my heat on. One of the foods that's really common in um, Latin America, but specifically Ecuador, since we're talking about that is just the plantain. Um, these typical bananas, and in Ecuador, you've got bananas of all different varieties, from itty bitty to bright fuchsia, red bananas. And so very similar, if you go to the grocery store and you've never interacted with plantain, especially the ripe plantain as they turn yellow, you might be confused, but they're two different foods. And the one that we're gonna be working with today is um, the green plantain. This is the unripe version of it. So it's much more starchy and less sweet. And um, I picked a recipe so that in case I was not in Ecuador, I could find ingredients. This is a super easy ingredient. So let me just go through the things that we're gonna be talking about, the ingredients today that we're gonna use. So for the Bologna de Verde, which is the, um, the uh, green plantain that we're going to use today, we're gonna use the green plantain. These happen to be from Guatemala. I see the sticker on them. We're also gonna use queso fresco. If I was home this week, I would have gone to the Saturday market where the cheese is made fresh with local milk. Um, but this is a really nice alternative. It's a very similar product. It's not quite like a mozzarella. It's really just a fresh cheese. So if you've ever made cheese before, um, it's just a fresh cheese, a little bit of salt in it. And um, we're gonna use that. Also, some of the things that we're going to put into the, um, the Bologna de Verde today is we're gonna use bacon bits. Um, these would be chicharrones, so it would have, you know, would have gotten that from the market, but this is kind of like the U.S. alternative of that. And then because I like things a little bit more savory, I'm going to add a little bit of onion, I'm going to add a little bit of fresh garlic, I'm going to add some spices to it. So I've got a little bit of red onion that I'm going to chop, a little bit of fresh garlic, I've got some basic sea salt and basic spices. This is where... Um, I've got the recipe that I think we'll post a link for, but oftentimes recipes are just a suggestion and a starting point. So I have found some of the things that I like and the ways that I want to incorporate that. And then hot chocolate. One of the things about Ecuador is that chocolate grows here. And so I've been so fortunate to be able to go and find places where I can get the raw cocoa, the raw chocolate. Um, now, what happens is there's a fruit and the fruit has seeds. The seeds are actually what we know as chocolate. The seeds are fermented and then roasted and then peeled. The outer husk is peeled. And some of you, it's becoming more popular. Cocoa nibs is that kind of raw state. They take that, they melt it down. And oftentimes at the markets, you can just buy that fresh chocolate that's prepared to that point. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about some of the chocolates. These are some of the chocolates that I brought back for a foodie friend who's working on some um, pre and probiotic foods that use chocolates. And I thought this will be really fun. This is some of the raw cacao. Picari is one of the award-winning chocolatiers that come out of our region. And so this is just pure raw cacao and some pure raw cacao with the nibs in it. 
that we'll be talking about, but these are going to Debbie. And so today we're just using simply some nice quality um, chocolate, raw chocolate from the, my, the local grocery store that was available here. So this will be a step down from super, super high-end hot chocolate, but one of the things I've been playing with there, ah! because when you're retired, you've got time, is chocolate and making the perfect cup of hot chocolate. So that's what we'll be doing today. Real simple recipes. I hope this will give everyone the chance for success. And so the, the first thing we're gonna do to get started, because this is kind of the prep work, is I'm gonna take this green plantain. And this would be like an unripe banana where it's a little bit difficult to get the skin off initially. So I just slice right down the middle of it as I peel that off. And the preparation stage that we're making for this balloon today is we're going to boil it. Now I'm going to take this peel off. I'm gonna slice it into some slices. Think about if you were making a peanut butter and banana sandwich, you'd slice those slices. I'm gonna do the same kind of thing for a couple of reasons. It just helps it cook quicker. And when we get done, we're gonna mash this down almost into like a dough. So this lets us be able to do this in the time frame allowed. Quick boiling that softens these up. Um, very similar that you would do if you were using to make uh, potatoes to make mashed potatoes. You'd peel them if you chose to, or you'd wash them off real good, and then you'd slice them. You could, of course, boil the whole potatoes, but you'd slice them smaller because it would let you cook them much quicker. So that's what I'm doing first with these. Green plantain, really common. Plantain is a very common staple kind of food both the green plantain and the sweet plantain. I tend to like the sweet plantain, which they oftentimes call Maduro. So I've already sliced up two of them in the pot and I've just added some water and I'm gonna set that on to boil. And then we're going to come back to that as we continue to do the preparation. So, you're cooking, I really think through logically the timing of things. How much time does something take? Um, how much cooking does it take? And kind of plan my meals oftentimes so that everything gets done at the same time so it's nice and hot and tasty all together. So with that idea of preparation in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and do a little bit of the preparation for things that I want to put into the balloon. Now, typically it would just be slightly seasoned. And as you'll see, you'd add the cheese and the chicharrones, but I'm gonna finally chop up a little bit of red onion. I'm gonna finally chop up a little bit of garlic and I'm gonna add a little bit more spicing to it than the recipe typically calls for. And that's just the freedom that you have with food. Recipes are great, and if you are not an experienced cook that spends time thinking about flavors and how they mix together, um, then recipes are an excellent way for you to really begin your food experience. But I challenge you to begin to think about the flavors that you like and the things that you like to eat. So I just peeled that, peeled that garlic. And let's see, I'm gonna move this just a little bit so we get just a little bit better view. All right, so I just peeled that garlic and I'm gonna chop it very finely. Now you could saute these onions if you want and garlic, I'm not, um, but you could. Again, this goes into once you begin to explore different foods, the freedom that you have to change the flavors around as you see fit. So I've got just some finely chopped garlic and I'm just gonna add those to the side of a plate as we um, gather the ingredients. I'm gonna move the rest of these plantain. These will probably be fried plantain for my grandson and I later this week or next week. I probably will let those sit and get a little bit sweeter. They will just ripen and come to a almost uh, just a, a, a dark black. They, uh, that in our mind, if you had a banana that was black, that black, you would think that it was not good, that it was spoiled. But that lets you know that that banana is super ripe and sweet. And that's the way I like them best. So those will be another sweet treat for 
my grandson and I later this, later in the coming week. So I've got a little bit of red onion and I'm gonna finely chop it also. And you'll kind of see at the end. And for the amount that I'm making, this is probably about a quarter cup of, um, about a quarter cup of chopped onion. I sliced it probably a quarter of an inch thick and now I'm dicing it. And as you'll see, this will give us a really fine kind of chop. If you want the onion chunkier, fine. I just like having a nice mince for this kind of thing. We're gonna actually make what will look like a large meatball um, shaped item out of this. And so having just the small chunks, especially since I'm not sauteing it, just appeals. And so as you see, those slices fall apart. My helper is very happy with this. He's eating banana and some orange, and he's very happy with snack time. So this is kind of giving us a base of some of the things that I'm gonna to use to add flavor to our bologna today. Any questions so far? We're just prepping. Is this, tell me in the comments, does this so far seem like you could do this yourself? Give me a yes or a one if this looks totally doable so far. So far so good with everyone? All right, now that we've gotten that, no one thinks this is doable. Anyone think this is doable? Yes. All right, all right. So I'm gonna rinse off my knife, my handy dandy knife. I'm gonna rinse off my surface here. And this isn't a cutting board, but we were trying to find a way to get the video so that you could see a bit of what I was doing. So now, that's the first step. The second thing, now that our plantain are boiling, we're getting them to a nice rolling boil. Let me see if I can help you to see what we've got going on. Nice, healthy boil. We're going to go ahead and get the base for our hot chocolate going. I like to warm up. Uh, the milk slow. Um, my neighbors, I happen to live in a building where the two other tenants are also expats. And so we are exploring together with Lorana at the lead. And we've had several experiments now with our hot chocolate making. And what I have found out is that heating your milk first is the key. Milk, cream, or another kind of plant-based milk of your choice goes into your pot. Now, for some people, they drink the cocoa without sweeteners. I am still very American and I expect hot chocolate to be sweet. And so um, back home, I have access to like raw cane sugar. Um, here at my daughter's, I'm just using agave. You could use honey. You could use sweetener of your choice. I'm just adding a little bit of that to the milk. And I'm going to turn that on to a slow heat. Now, we have figured out that there is a ratio that makes for the best hot chocolate. And so far, this very unscientific research says that for every two cups of milk, you want about one ounce of chocolate. Now, not everybody uh, uh, travels through life with a scale for weighing their food or creating recipes like me. But if you look at your package, this is a three ounce package. Basic math says about a third of this package is an ounce. So we're gonna open this up and I'll show you how I do the preparation for my chocolate. So we're gonna open it up. Now this is something that is to taste. But in this unscientific research that we've had going on, we have realized that about an ounce is a really good mix. We tried it once before with way too much chocolate, and this is one of those cases where too much is not a good thing. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, 15 squares. If I open this up about one ounce or one third, there's three columns, and I'm just gonna break off 
approximately an ounce of that chocolate. And unfortunately, something else will have to be done with this chocolate at a later time. That's a story for a later, um, a later moment. And what I like to do as my milk is heating up is I like to go ahead and chop up my chocolate. You could take a small grater and chop it up. You could use chocolate chips. Um, the alternative for you here is one, of course, buy um, a cacao bar. Um, these are readily available through Instacart. Um, I think I ordered today from Kroger. Um, these are things that you can find in a lot of different places. Um, check and see where they're coming from. See if it's fair trade. See if this is a chocolate where the farmers are really being treated equitably. That's something that's important for me. Um, but you can feel comfortable using any kind of chocolate. Um, things that are available now, um, because of just our global access that you can get really good chocolates from around the world. So I take, and what I do is I just chop um, into smaller bits because I find that this just helps as I prepare to melt this chocolate. Now, other things that you can add into this, if you like, would be things like cinnamon or nutmeg. You can use your own creativity. Um, we've done several rounds where um, we've done we've done some uh, 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 experimental cooking rounds where we've used ginger, and that's a really nice addition to hot chocolate for me. You can use fresh ginger, of course, and add it to your liquids that are boiling, or you could use ginger powder. Um, but you can take this any way. This is the nice thing about recipes. You can simply choose a recipe as a starting point and then decide what else you want to do to enhance it, to make it specific and really tasty to your taste buds. So we've got the milk. I don't want it to boil. Let's see if I can kind of show you. I'm getting it down to just a slight boil. So that's a little bit faster than I want. So I wanna turn that milk down because I want it to just simmer. We just want to simmer because we do not want to scorch that milk. And now that I've got it up to heat, I'm going to add in my delicious chocolate. Chocolate is something that is very common um, and used in many ways. I've been exposed to um, some of the things that they do with chocolate. And there's a chocolate ceremony that they do, where they use it in some of their spiritual practices. And then stir. If you have a whisk, I would just whisk because what's gonna happen is that chocolate's gonna slowly melt and incorporate. I have found that adding my sweetener to my milk and starting that process first is the best way to get a nice, smooth and creamy hot chocolate. We've tried it other ways, we tried it adding the chocolate to cold milk and then heating from there. <clears throat> We've tried it adding the sweetener later and I just have found that adding the sweetener to the milk first and allowing that to heat up and then adding the chocolate into that uh, tends to give a much smoother finished product to the hot cocoa. Again, we learned that adding too much chocolate, um, chocolate um, by itself in this raw state is bitter. Um, to my taste buds. And so adding um, uh, too much chocolate gives you a bitterness that I find can't be compensated by the sweetener that you added. So I'm gonna turn this down very low. Slow and steady is the game. I'm turning this down. I'm working with an electric stove. I usually cook on a gas stove. So you've got to kind of gauge this by your own cooking surface. And so I'm turning this down to about a two and a half, three, and I'm just gonna stir this regularly. So that's got that part of it going. And I'm gonna rinse this off again so that little chocolate doesn't get all over everything and create a mess. If you kind of clean up as you go, it takes the chore out of cooking. All right, so now I've got my fork and what I'm testing is I want to get these nice and soft. Fork tender 
like you would for a potato, because what we're going to do is we're going to mash them, okay? So as you can see, that's about how tender I want them. The ones that I put in first before you guys saw me have already kind of gotten to that stage of softness. I'm gonna let them go for just a minute longer to be able to let the rest of them get a little bit more tender. And while I do that, I'm gonna finish the preparation because as I explained, oh, let me wipe the chocolate off of there, that we're gonna use cheese. Now what this does is we take that, and I'll kind of give you the preview of what we're going to do, is we'll take that, um, the plantain, the green plantain, we're gonna mash that and season that into like a dough. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna incorporate this cheese into it. And I like to add a nice chunk of it to the middle. And then we've got some options because sometimes you will find it served just like that. Other times you will find it where they take and then we'll fry that or bake that, most often though fried. And so I'm gonna take some of this cheese and same kind of thinking like with the onions where I want it into fine kind of bits because then those bits are permeated throughout the whole ball. And I don't know if I said in the beginning, but this is something that would be very typical for breakfast. Let me tell you about my first experience with Bologna de Verde. And I was uh, on an exploratory trip to Ecuador as I was thinking about relocating. And one of the places that I had the opportunity to spend a few days was a, um, a fishing town called Porto Lopez. And oftentimes in the morning, people would be out, the boats would be coming in like six o'clock in the morning. Sunrise is usually about 6.30 at that uh, point close to the equ uh, equator. And oftentimes there'd be little restaurants. And by restaurants, I mean a little tent with a cook thing and a table, and there'd be someone out there cooking fresh food. And on one of those mornings that I was out just in amazement with the fishermen, um, I stopped by one of those spots and had uh, Bologna de Verde. It was new to me, but it was a tasty and filling kind of breakfast. They do it a couple of other ways where it's not in a ball, but this is one of the ways that I've seen and you'll see the street food vendors. So what I've got is some larger chunks and you'll see as we prepare those balls, we'll put those in the middle and so it'll be this nice cheesy treat in the middle. They want to know what inspired you to consider Ecuador as a retirement location. So my work is healing healing and figuring out how we create sustainable community. And I realized that healing was central to that. And as I retired and really began thinking about other ways to live out those passions, the passion work that I feel called to, um, I thought about, but how do you take care of you? What's healing about for you? And I began visioning. I said I was gonna take a year after retirement to really vision what I'd like life to be. And I started thinking, What's the next layer of healing? I spent a lot of time on emotional healing, the traumas that we pick up in life and how to heal that. But I've also had to do some work because I've not always taken care of my body well. And so as I began to think about where might be a good place for me to work out and live through the next chapter of my life, I decided that I wanted to be somewhere where the weather was pleasant. I wanted to be sarong and flip-flop weather all year long. And my perfect temperature is 74 degrees. So I don't wanna to be too hot. I don't wanna to be too cold. I've done farming in the South, in South Carolina where it's a hundred plus degrees with a huge heat index and humidity. And I just decided I didn't want that as my permanent. I wanted to go to a place where I felt the least resistance for healing, especially on the physical plane. And so I decided as I began looking, uh, Ecuador has access to clean water uh, coming down from the mountains. They've got access to the mineral contents of the earth coming from the volcanic springs. They have access to clean foods. They have access to clean air. The country is relatively sustainable in that they produce quite a bit for themselves. And so someone who's done a lifetime of work about sustainability that appealed and then as the cherry or the ice cream on top, it's a nation who's given nature legal rights. 
so someone on behalf of nature can go in courts and be able to have a voice for nature. It's a nation who has said nature has the right to thrive and evolve too. And so all of those factors together, I'm a young retiree and so there's definitely an economic factor as well. The cost of living, the difference when I'm here in the States visiting to be able to eat primarily plant-based, not exclusively, um, but primarily because of the health benefits. It takes me about $150 a week, sometimes more to eat the fresh fruits and vegetables. That same amount of fruits and vegetables for me at the local mercados cost about $15 a week in Ecuador. And so when I put all of those factors together, Cuenca is a beautiful town that melds the old and the new together. I can walk in the streets and see indigenous women there shelling peas, different varieties of peas, but in their indigenous clothing, connected steel to those cultures and see them right next to the high tech light rail train that goes through for 35 cents. The weather averages 70 to 76 degrees 12 months out of the year with a low temperature in the 50s, which truly is sarong and flip-flop weather to me with maybe a sweater at night. And so when I began to put those factors together and then visit it, it was one of those places that felt beautiful to me. And that's an important piece when we're talking about things like healing is what do you feel? How does this place make you feel? Because that's part of my wellness. And so it's a place that feels beautiful that has access to things like jazz and American blues, that has access to art and all of the beautiful colors that goes with it. But the excitement of my life is it has access to food, plentiful food, food that you buy when it's at the peak of its ripeness because it comes from right there. And so my pineapples are the kind that if you think back to your childhood and you ate something delicious and the juice just ran down and dripped off the bottom of your elbow, food that's at that level of ripeness all the time. And so for me, it has been a wonderful transition as I embark onto the what you gonna do now that you retired and you like to work kind of move, mode. So that is part of the reasons why I've made Ecuador my new home. And I'm uh, grateful for the experience. All right, so now, plan Wait, plan. We have a We have a question about the, uh, Hang on, let me get to it. They've, they've Other cheeses in this dish. Yes, so yes. The, the, the closest, there's some similarities. One, uh, uh, queso fresco is widely available here. If it's not at your, it's more than likely in your regular grocery store, no special place you have to go. If you don't find it, a Latin, Mexican, something of that variety kind of specialty grocery store would have these. But this is, as you can see, this is just Kroger brand. They had six or seven different varieties at Kroger today. So that's the first thing. Queso, fresh, uh, uh, queso fresco, and that's just fresh cheese is available widely. If you don't have that, two cheeses that I think would work really well, mozzarella would be one. It has a very similar kind of flavor. Mozzarella really is like a fresh cheese. If you wanna get closer to the taste and texture, um, most grocery stores you can find fresh mozzarella, like the kind that's in a liquid brine. That would be a very close substitution. If that wasn't available, you could try like a feta cheese. A feta cheese would be a little bit more salty, but similar in the way that it would work. And then this is where recipes are flexible, they're suggestions. Try it with a cheddar cheese, try it with a smoked Gouda, try it with the flavors that you already like. But those would be some starting points if you weren't able to find the queso fresco, okay? Any other questions so far in the process? Uh, Cuenca, to... Ecuador. Cuenca, Ecuador, C-U-E-N-C-A, Ecuador, is uh, where home is now. Was this? Hmm. Maybe why? Uh, yes, year round for I I had an incident a couple of weeks ago. It was a little bit chilly, and by chilly I mean it was like in the low 60s. And I wanted to put some socks on, and then I realized in my transition I have not yet relocated any shoes that were closed toed. I thought, 
isn't this a delightful dilemma? You've had one day in nine months where you might want to put on shoes that weren't your croc flip flops. I just simply put on a fl uh, put my flip flops on anyway and put a sweater on and it was all fine. All right, so we've got our plants and then I took a little bit enough for me to be able to make in this bowl. And you want to do this part rather rapidly. You want to do it while it's warm. I'm going to add a little bit of seasoning, just a little bit to taste. I happen to like red pepper flakes when I go savory. So I'm adding a little bit of that. I'm adding a little bit of um, um, onion powder because even though I'm using onions and garlic, I like to add a little bit of that. Remember those uh, that preparation work we did? It's because we want to operate with this. We want to um, maneuver this while it's warm. So I'm going to add in the garlic. I'm just going to add about half because I used just about half of those plantings that we cooked. I'm going to give that just a quick mix first. Get those spices incorporated in and then I'm going to add in our cheese. And this is something that um, if you are vegetarian, this does have cheese, but if you're vegetarian, the bacon is optional. Chicharrones are common. Pork is a very common animal there and they roast them and the skin is crispy. So um, chicharrones is a common kind of thing, but you can absolutely omit that. Um, you can add a vegetarian substitute if you just want a little bit of that flavor that bacon gives. And now what we're going to do is, I'm just gonna push this aside. I've got our larger chunks, don't forget. I happen to like cheese. So the more the better. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just turn this out. Let me know if you're having problems seeing this. But what you get is this kind of sticky dough. Is everybody seeing that? And we're just kind of incorporating this. And then what I'm going to do, let me rinse my hands quickly and grab a spoon. Is we are going to make balls. Now, typically, if you were there and you were at a street vendor, the balls would be about the size of a baseball. So this would be a very hearty breakfast, but I'm just creating that. I'm grabbing a couple of chunks of cheese and I'm wrapping around that. My hands are just a little bit damp because it is sticky. And what we end up with is this ball. So let me, while it's warm, I'm gonna work through that. I'm just using the back of the spoon to kind of press that flat so that I can add my cheese. And then I'm wrapping that around and kind of coating using that um, dough. If you've made meatballs, you understand. And yes, I, I, just, I just like red pepper flakes. Surprisingly, red pepper flakes was one of the challenging things for me to find. It is not a common thing that you can find in the grocery store. Fortunately, I'm very resourceful. And there is what is now my favorite spice shop. It's a bulk spice shop called Graham Bulk Shop. And they have a variety of spices, including the red pepper flakes that I um, enjoy cooking with. Um, most cooks have their favorite spice blend. If you're from the Louisiana, it's usually kind of the celery, carrot, onion kind of combo. Um, mine is more of an eclectic blend. I'm a salt, black pepper, red pepper flake, garlic person. Like that's my go-to spice. And again, you wanna work with this while it's warm. This is a similar way of cooking that oftentimes the starchy vegetables, one of the other vegetables that's common is yucca. And it's the same kind of thing, whether it's making a tortilla, um, which is like a, a little flatbread that they make with yucca and some of the other kinds of foods like this, um, or bologna. So this is kind of a, like a really common way of using starches. You boil it down, you mash it, and then you use that kind of as a dough. And like I said, these are a little bit smaller. Um, but this typically would be about a literally a baseball size um, ball. And we've used, like I said, about half. 
I think I used three plantain. So if you were doing this just for yourself as an experiment, one plantain would probably give you about four or five balls, depending on how large it was. Now, we got some options. For some people, this is as far, everything in here is cooked or able to be eaten in the state that it is. So for some people, I'm gonna rinse my hands off once again. This will be one way of serving it. But we're gonna add another little bit to it because one of the other ways, and what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna move this pot with my plantain. I'll use that for something else later. I'm gonna take our hot cocoa. Let me give you some visuals so that you can kind of see where we're at in the process. The color is darkening. It's getting to really melted consistency. And so slow is better. Slow, slow, slow. Okay, so I'm gonna move that to my back burner, turn that on about one and a half. That buys us a little time. You do not want to scorch your milk. And then in my front, what I'm going to do is we're going to add a little bit of oil. And one of the ways that you will typically see this is either in the state that it's in now, unfried, or you will see it cooked in oil. And it'll fry it on the outside till it gets crispy. And so that's what we're going to do. Um, about two cups of milk or cream um, for one ounce of chocolate. That's about the mix that we have found to be um, the best in our unscientific research of the 409 International House, as we affectionately call our um, residents. Uh, it's got two other households of expats, so we are all exploring together. So the Boulogne are the balls, we've got all of our goodies inside and the secret extra cheese that we can add. And so I'm turning my heat on now to get my oil up to a nice temperature. And we're going to get those fried, which will give it a nice crispy outside. Um, some of those small chunks of cheese, but it'll just give us a nice crispiness and it'll heat it all the way through again. It'll reheat that. And so we've got these nice little balls. They set up. And like I said, this is a very hearty breakfast. This would be very typical. Um, when I first had Boulogne de Verde, it was served with um, some fresh fruit. It was served with coffee and some fresh juice. Um, would be kind of just a typical customary kind of breakfast that lasts, lasts. It would be like our equivalent of, you know, eating grits and you know something that's really heavy and hearty in the morning, this would be it. And again, um, plantain, or something, plantain or something that's very common and readily available year round. Um, the, the banana farms and the plantain farms are quite extensive in the region that I'm in. Um, so if this were served in Ecuador, like I said, be the size of a baseball, maybe even larger, not quite as big as a softball, but like literally. And so that and some fruit and some juice and some coffee would be um, about uh, a breakfast serving. So this is about um, not quite half. So this is about maybe one, one and a half of our plantain. If I had made the large balls, I don't have a deep fryer here to be able to just kind of drop them in. So I've made them a little bit smaller so that I don't have to use a whole lot of oil. Um, but two or three of these would be about equivalent of what one of the large ones would be for a meal. So I'm just gonna let my um, oil heat. And so this really would be about two portions. So one to two plantains would be servings for one to two people in the morning. All right. I think I had a little bit of moisture in there, but my water is hot I and mean, then my oil is hot. And so I'm just gonna, Place my balloon. And I'm trying not to use a whole lot of oil. I don't fry that often. So I'll be turning these over as each of the sides kind of gets brown. And so 
The other way that these could be prepared is you could now put them in the oven as well. So that gives you another alternative and that would give it a nice crust also. Let's get back to our hot chocolate though and talk about this because what you see is now that darkness as it melts and I'm using cream here because it gives you a nice thickness, kind of a decadent kind of hot chocolate. And as you can see, it gets darker as that chocolate really fully is beginning to melt and gets incorporated. And as you can see, you're getting less of a kind of speckled look to it and more of a creamy, smooth look to it. And so just whisking this on this slow heat is gonna give us just a really nice decadent hot chocolate. So much better than just like a cocoa packet. Not that there's anything wrong with that, because if that's what you got, use it. But being able to have access to fresh foods is just a wonderful thing. All right, so we've got this going. I was looking for my tongs. I had them, I had them, I had them. I've got them. And I'll move the, one of the cameras over so you can kind of see what we're doing. And so normally if I was home, I can get um, the raw, raw chocolate. Um, this is also one of the brands that I brought back for, for one of my foodie friends. This is Bakari, which is one of the award-winning chocolates that come out of the region. Um, if you, uh, so th that's some of the stuff I use. I usually use things that don't have a label because they're, I can buy them local um, for today because I didn't want to open up the Picari that I was bringing for my foodie friend. I uh, picked a, um, a dark chocolate from the grocery. And this just happens to be, this is one of the ones that um, you know serves wildlife. It's a dark chocolate. These, I usually work with 100% cacao, but you can use anything less than that. But 100% cacao is pretty easy to find nowadays. So I'm, let me just show you, I'm gonna take this one and let's see, through the magic of technology, if I can switch this around, then I can show you what we're doing here. And so I'm just trying to get a nice crispy edge all the way around. If I had a deep fryer, I would just drop these in a basket and fry them, but I'm trying not to waste up all my daughter's oil, especially I don't do a lot of frying, so I don't really wanna have that waste, but that's how we're doing this. And as you can see, they're getting just a nice crispy coating. Some of that cheese gets into that oil and gives you that nice crispiness, but that is absolutely not an essential with the balone de verde, and you will see it served both ways. Um, the first time that I experienced it, it was not fried. And so um, it's it, when you're eating it, it's almost like crumbly where it'll kind of open up and you'll be able to kind of eat it with a fork or with a spoon. And our chocolate is getting to this dark, almost velvety, let's see, that worked really well with the camera the first time. Let me see if I can, Switch you back. We're getting this nice velvety dark chocolate. I don't know if you can see so much the change of the color, but if you try this, you will be able to really <laughs> see that that darkness kind of begins to come into it. And you're getting almost with the heavy cream, like almost a pudding consistency. I've done this with whole milk as well as um, heavy cream. And I just, I'm a heavy cream fan. So I like the richness that that extra fat um, does. It's, it's kind of like cooking with butter that there's just a little bit difference. Um, you of course could use plant-based milk. I have not experienced, experimented too much with that with the raw cacao, but that is an option. Again, I'm just turning these as we get done. And we're just getting a nice coating. If you guys can see that, I hope you guys can pretend like you're smelling it. 
because it's uh, smelling quite delicious. And I'm gonna just turn that and get that edge. Again, if you have a deep fryer, this probably would work really well in like an air fryer. That would be kind of like the oven version, but it would give you um, that similar kind of outside crispy crunchiness. And our cocoa is pretty well incorporated. And so we are going to plate this and then I'd be more than willing to answer any questions and be your official unofficial taste tester. So, all right, so I've got my mug while those balloons fry up. And, you know, this is the magic of internet where of course this looks perfect, but before we started, I had some coffee and I got about a half a cup of coffee. So this is really gonna be a mochaccino, but it's just between us. So y'all don't tell nobody this is not true, pure hot chocolate, but I got this coffee and it's just delightful when you add it in. So I'm gonna add a little bit of that. This will actually be a mochaccino. You guys got a little bit more than you were expecting because I'm adding it anyway. Let me get something so that I can stir that. I probably should have heated up the coffee before I added it to that. But nonetheless, well, any of you are spoon lickers at your house when you cook, like you want to get it all. And I've got my plate and my tongs. And if you'll give me a moment, let me, what I'm gonna do is I will deal with the rest of the ingredients for a later snack, but I'm gonna get these off of the stove so that I can turn off the heat. get myself to a safe point by turning everything off. And I'll just put these over here. This will be a snack for later. And as I move things around, appreciate your patience as we change. I am my set health. And in just that amount of time, what we end up with is this just really tasty, and quite hearty um, breakfast food and some of what I have found to be the delightful treats of South Carolina. So sorry that you all can't taste along with me, but the recipe is in the chat if you would like to try this. Um, frying, I fry it on a nice rolling kind of heat because of that cheese, I don't want it to completely melt. I want just the outside to get crispy because we're not really cooking this. We're just crisping up the outside. And so what you're left with is this, you can't see the stringiness, but this decadent ball where the cheese, it cooks those onions just a little bit and you get that, the chicharron, so you get the bacon, and it really just is a nice decadent feel to your mouth, but a tasty treat. Um, yes, that is the benefits I get to, you know, someone has to, you know, for quality control purposes, taste it all. So I am doing that on your behalf. Consider that my sacrifice for the sake of the cultural creations for the Atlantic Institute. I will be forced to taste these things for you and enjoy the delicious treats. And so that is my offering today of one of the 
wonderful delights, two of the wonderful delights that I have experienced um, since making this transition to Ecuador. Um, don't let the continental divide stop you from trying this. These are ingredients that I have found easy to find right here in the States. And so venture out and try something a little bit different than your usual fare. Um, try this when you've got time. This would make a really nice brunch addition um, to try some new things from new places using foods that you've probably seen in a new way. Um, I don't uh, coat them. I might spray my container, like uh, if I was using a baking pan in the oven, I might spray that with a little bit of oil just because that cheese could melt a little bit and stick. Um, but letting it go, there's oils in the cheese, there's oils in the chicharrones if you use those. And you're just trying to get a nice kind of baked coating on the, which gives you this nice crispy outside. Thank you, Lorana. This is awesome. Everybody, uh, this video will be available on our Atlantic Institute SC YouTube channel at the end of next week. Sorry, I have a volunteer that uploads them for me. But we have over 170 videos on that channel. Um, not all of them cooking. There's some of our cultural creations, some of our religious um, programs that we do, some of our educational programs I do. So go check that out in the meantime until this one comes up. If you like that channel, I believe it tells you when something new gets added to it. So you would know when we add that channel, um, this video on there. Yeah. Um, if we don't have any more questions, I oh, am let going you, to- let me, go back, let me go back and just give a few questions. Um, I, someone asked about lactose intolerance. Plant-based cheeses would definitely be an alternative for that if that is something that you're into, or you can leave it out. Um, again, recipe is a starting point. Definitely could be air fried. I think we talked about the chocolate. I use 100% um, raw chocolate, but today I'm using, I think, an 88% that I got from Kroger. Um, the difference is sweetness level. If you use something that's closer to like a milk chocolate, I would definitely um, taste it to make sure that you're not oversweetening it. When I use 100% cacao, I kind of know what my sweetness level is, and that has no sweetness to it whatsoever. Um, feta and dried mint, yes. You could also do things like parsley or cilantro. Those would be things, cilantro is one of its common. That would be another herb. Um, you could take this anyway. Once you begin to learn, the plantain is, the green plantain is not a super strong flavor. So you could use anything that you would put into mashed potatoes, you could do plantain. You can, this goes the savory route. That's why they use this instead of the sweeter, the plantain once it's ripe, this is savory. So the alternative is potato. Think of anything you would do with a mashed potato, you could do with the mashed plantain. So those flavor profiles that you would add to a mashed potato, would you put garlic? Would you put rosemary? Would you do whatever, whatever, and whatever. It may depend on how you're serving this. Just because this is breakfast, this is still a nice starchy side dish, either in balls or they also do it where it's done like hash, where it was, it's not in balls, it's just like in the skillet that you cook it down. So these are other ways that you could use this. Like, even though it's a breakfast food, wait a minute, I could use plantain as one of my starches. And the same way that you would make um, shepherd's pie. <laughs> Some of the Caribbean cultures use green plantain as the starch instead of the potatoes and plantain, uh, like in a in shepherd's pie. Um, they also use even the sweet ones, they slice it thin and use that as the layers for like a lasagna type food instead of pasta. So this is a way that if you're just wanting to play with food or you're trying to incorporate more plant-based foods in different ways, these are some ways that this may give you kind of a foundation, just a start in your food playing for you to be able to explore a little bit more. Um, were there any other questions, final call for questions? I think those were all of the ones that I saw. Yeah, I think those were all questions that I saw. So I am turning it back over to you. Thank you so much for letting me cook with you. Thank you for coming in and sharing this cooking time with me and my grandson and um, leaving me with delicious treats that I will go on and eat after you guys leave. Paula, I'm turning it back over to you. 
Thanks, Lorana. Thank you again for doing this. Um, she just got back from Ecuador a couple days ago, so thank you again. Um, thank you everybody for coming. I am now ending the recording. Stop recording. Um,